they're considered gomads because they are producing those sex cells. So specifically, what do we call sex cells? Egg and sperm. So what are the terms for those? Gametes. Right. So we know that makes sense. All right. So gonads are going to be making gametes. Good. Uh, when we have puberty, so the maturation, right, of our tissue, what is our first step in hormonal regulation? So when we go through puberty, what's the first of the first things that has to happen in order for us to mature those tissues? Absolutely, right. So we know that the very first thing that has to happen is hypothalamus, right? I have to have a hypothalamus making gonadotropin releasing hormone, right? And then what is that going to be targeting? It targets what? Pituitary, right? So it tells the anterior pituitary to secrete the gonadotropins, which are your follicle stimulating hormone um, and your luteinizing hormone. And then they will target, right, either the testes or the ovaries. Okay, our pelvic floor, which houses muscles for organ support and continence, is known as what? So our shared anatomical pelvic floor. Starts with a P. Perineum, right, perineum, good. So we have this perineum. Um, in that area, we have two different triangles. So what is our more anterior triangle? What do we think? Urogenital, right, so for urinary system, right, so genital, so urogenital. And then um, uh, posterior, what are we gonna have? Anal, right, so we have urogenital and then we're also gonna have the anal triangle. Okay, so if I am a body cell, right, a somatic cell, how many autosomes do I have? So we can say how many paired autosomes do I have? What do we think? 22, right. So I would have to put in paired to make this a little bit more clear. And if I said how many total autosomes, we would have 44, correct? So make sure that we understand the difference between there. If a cell is diploid, how many total chromosomes does it have? 46, right, so we understand, right, that last set is going to be those sex chromosomes, adding more. Good. Uh, if we are a somatic cell, what sort of division do we go through? Mitosis, right, so if I'm somatic, I am going to be going through mitosis. Meiosis is just for those sex cells, right? Okay, at the end of meiosis, how many daughter cells do we have? We should have four, right? So we have two that are produced at the end of meiosis one, two are produced at the end of meiosis two. So we have four total. And when we're looking at meiosis, how do we have genetic variation? So I mentioned there's two events, right? There's two things that occur during meiosis that allows our cells, our daughter cells, to have variability. So what's the first one that happens in prophase? We have crossing over, right? So the chromosomes exchange genetic material. So that's the big one. Do we remember our second thing that uh, gives us a little bit of variability? It's in metaphase, but exactly what for? So what, what about metaphase gives us variability? I think I heard it. So the, basically it's independent assortment, right? The law of independent assortment. Meaning that when the chromosomes line up, right, along the equator, they do it randomly. So when they get pulled apart, it's random, right? Because they are distributed randomly. So that gives us a little bit more variation. Uh, now, let's see what we have. Okay, so general flow chart, right, for gametogenesis. So you guys will have to know all of the cells involved, right, the different stages, and of course, uh, our, our uh, life cycle, so if we're diploid or haploid. So when we're looking at gametogenesis, right, we know that we have to start with stem cells. So what do we call those stem cells? General. We know it. What is it? So if it's easier to think about it in, a, in like a male versus female, what do we call it in a mid? Spermatogonia would be for men, so how do we say that generally? Gametogonia, right? So we have to start with a stem cell, which is the gonia cell. So gametogonia, we know is gonna be our stem cell, right? They're going through mitosis. So what does that mean about them? How many, are they haploid or diploid? They have to be diploid, right? If they're going through mitosis, they're still considered a somatic cell. So gametogonia, right, goes through mitosis. 
what are we going to make after we commit? What is our next cell? It's a spermat or spermatocyte, so that's for men, but it's a gametocyte, but more specifically, right, it's a primary gametocyte, right? So we know that we're going to have a primary gamet uh, gametocyte, and then we divide again, what do we make? Secondary, right? And then we divide again, and what's our products? Gametids, right? So just like spermatid, uh, we have gametids. So um, these guys, are they haploid or diploid? All of these guys are haploid, right? Because eventually, right, when we mature or get to the mature version of whatever the sex cell is, we want to make sure that we only have that half number of chromosomes so that we can have fertilization. So this should make sense, right? Understanding the flow of things. So gametogonia, right, goes to primary gametocyte, secondary gametocyte, gametid, and then you go to your maturation for whatever um, sex you're working with. So we can then apply, right, our male uh, sex. So if we take all of those terms, now just switch it to in regards to men. So what are we starting with? Our stem cell, what is it? So spermatogonia, right? So just being comfortable with changing those names. So spermatogonia gives us primary spermatocyte, right, which will then give us our secondary spermatocyte, which will then give us what? Spermatids, right. So we understand that flow through. Yes? Are the primary spermatocytes No, primary spermatocytes are haploid. Everything other than your stem cell. So your stem cell is diploid, but once it starts going into meiosis, they turn haploid. Okay. Now, uh, I don't think we mentioned, but what is our, so spermatid, what is our mature gamete? So what do we call that? Spermatozoa, right? So our final, uh, final uh, 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 form for them. Now, if we follow through with our female version, right? So we start off stem cell, right? Oogonia. So we have oogonia, which is then going to go into that primary oocyte. We know that that's going to give us a secondary oocyte. At what stage are we going to hit secondary oocyte for female repro? Is it uh, before puberty? Is it what? When are we going to be dealing with a secondary oocyte? During, so specific, so after puberty, right, so once puberty starts, but specifically ovulation, correct, right, so we have to have that ovulation, that's when we have that secondary oocyte. And then we have fertilization, right, so we also remember little differences between men versus women. So for the women, right, we have two phases of arrestment, correct? So when do we start making primary oocytes? Is it during puberty? No. Right? Why is it not during puberty? When do we make primary oocytes? Before we're even born, right? We have primary oocytes, we have primordial follicles, that's why it says development week five, right? So our oogonia is starting to uh, give rise to that primary oocyte when we're still in fetal development. So we have, when we're born, we already have those primary oocytes. They are arrested until we hit puberty. Once we hit puberty, we're gonna resume, and we're only gonna finish, right, meiosis two, um, if we have that fertilization occurring. So if we do have that fertilization occurring, we see, right, we can form that zygote, which now is that haploid or diploid. Diploid, correct? All right, so if I have fusion of egg and sperm, we know that that resulting cell will have a full set of chromosomes. So what else can we see? What else have I blocked out these guys? What do we call these guys? Polar bodies, right. Are polar bodies usually viable? Typically, no. So we really only make that one uh, good egg and then we have residual polar bodies because of our um, uh, after effects of divided. Okay, so understanding our flow charts, right? Understanding the names of the cells, right? When they're haploid versus diploid, how to get to a uh, mature version of the gamete. So now we're gonna look at our male repro. So, male repro, what's our difference between spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis? They sound very similar, but technically they are different. Do we have any idea? Are they making the same thing? Mm, 
so questions, right, to think about. So, technically, this leads into this. So, both of these, we see the words genesis, so we are creating something. Obviously, it's in relation to sperm, but spermatogenesis is the entire beginning where we get to developing a spermatid. So that's where we see the T from. So spermat, think of spermatid. So this is the initial steps all the way from your stem cell to making a spermatid. Spermiogenesis is the process of making the spermatozoa. So your last step in the entirety of gametogenesis. So just making that mature sperm cell. And then, uh, do they happen in the same place? So, if I make a spermatid versus a spermatozoa, why uh, is it that there's different areas for this? So, where do I make a spermatid? In the seminiferous tubules, right? In the testes, right? So, inside the testes, in the seminiferous tubules. How is that different from a spermatozoa? Are we still in the testes? No. We're not in the testes anymore, where are we? Epididymis, right, that cap on the testes. So mature sperm are gonna be in the epididymis. Spermatids are gonna be in the uh, seminiferous tubules inside the testes. Do all spermatogonia develop into primary spermatocytes? What do we think? <laughs> So we know that that's a stem cell, right? And if we follow the flow chart, we know that they develop <coughs> into primary spermatocytes. Do all of them do that? No, right? And there's the logic behind that, right? Do you want your entire population of stem cells committing to the cell? No, you don't want that because you want some stem cells to replenish the stem cell population, right? So we have that asymmetrical mitotic division that we saw. So we're not gonna have every uh, spermatogonia develop into a spermatocyte. So we're gonna have some that just stay and will replenish the spermatogonia population. If we're being specific, you guys saw right in our lecture, it's type B spermatogonia that will commit to becoming a spermatocyte. So type A spermatogonia will stay and replenish the population of our stem cells. Okay, so would a secondary spermatocyte or a spermatid be closer to the lumen inside of a seminiferous tubule? So this harps on uh, our pattern of development, right? So we remember we saw that cut right inside, like looking at a histology, and we'll see that in a couple, uh, a couple slides. So we're looking at inside a seminiferous tubule. Do we remember the pattern of development? Is it random where the cells are inside of a seminiferous tubule? No, so which of these is gonna be closer to the lumen? Do we remember? Do we remember what the pattern is? What is the general rule of thumb? As they mature, they go towards the lumen. So in order to answer this, you have to know which of these is more mature, right? So secondary spermatocyte or spermatid? Spermatid is more mature. Therefore, the spermatid will be closer to the lumen than the secondary spermatocyte. The most immature are gonna be closer to the basement membranes, right, on each tubule. So that's where you're gonna have like your spermatogonia um, and your other immature cells. Now, as we become a spermatid, right, we saw that we have to go through modifications because clearly, right, a spermatogonia and a primary spermatocyte looks nothing like your finished product, right? So we have to go through modifications when we hit that spermatid stage. So what sort of modifications do we have? There's a couple of them. There's like three really big ones. We got to elongate, right? So we no longer look like a little circle. So what else do we have to have? What do we have to put on the head region of the spermatid? Acrosome cap, right? We got to put that acrosome cap because that helps out in digestion. What else do we have to develop? A tail, right? A flagella. So we have to have that motility. So those are really big, uh, three really big things that will modify. What about the cytoplasm? Do we keep our cytoplasm? Typically, no. We shed the cytoplasm. So we come a little bit more easier to swim. Okay, so general anatomy. So starting from the testes, right? So let's work our pathway up. We have testes. We know that that's where we have the immature sperm. Epididymis, right? Then what do we have over here, this big tube? What is this? What is that? 
vas deferens, right? Vas deferens, you can also say ductus deferens. So vas deferens goes up, goes behind the bladder. Where are we merging? What is this little structure? Ah, so a seminal vesicle, right? So seminal vesicle. Now don't get it confused because they do sound quite similar. This is a seminal vesicle inside of here with the immature sperm or seminiferous tubules. So seminiferous tubules, seminal vesicles, a little bit different. Now we're going to pierce right into the prostate via a duct. So do we remember that duct? Ejaculatory duct, right? So the ejaculatory duct will lead into the prostate and then we can go through, right, the different regions of the urethra, which we'll see in a little bit. But we already mentioned prostate, so that's easy to identify. What's this tiny guy right below the prostate? What do we think? Really small, 5% of semen. First thing that comes out, vulval urethral gland, right? So very, very small gland. Good. Okay, so. Uh, what's the function of the scrotum? Has a very important function. What is that? How do we uh, umbrella term that? Regulating temperature, right? Because we saw that sperm cells are very susceptible. They cannot live at body core temperature. Now we have two muscles that help to regulate the temperature. Do we know the two of them? We have the one that's outside, so kind of superficial, right under the skin, is that uh, dartos muscle, right? The one that covers the spermatic cord to kind of elevate is going to be the cremaster muscle. So dartos and cremaster are going to be helping out and moving the testes. <coughs> okay, so sagittal cut of the testes, right? So when we look at this, we got to understand how to get out of the testes, correct? So we're starting off in our lobules, right? So our um, uh, seminiferous tubules. So we're going to be going out. We're draining into this first area, right? We call that reedy testes. And then we go through these efferent ducts. Our laser has died. So efferent ducts right over here. And then what am I emptying into? What is all of this? It's just a different view of something we've already mentioned, right? So what sits on top of the testes? The epididymis, right? We mentioned that it is super coiled, so it's, it's an extremely coiled down to its own um, pack size. So after we get through the epididymis, we see that we're then going to go through that vas deferens. We also saw that there's some different connective tissues, right, that help to um, uh, uh, cushion the testes as well as divide the, the lobules. So all of this kind of purple, tunica vaginalis, and then this white, we name it after the white, so Latin, so tunica albuginis. So this is complete. Okay. okay, so what do we see over here? So this is a beautiful picture of what? What does this look like? Is it a man, a woman? What are we thinking? So even though this was not in the PowerPoint, this is a beautiful picture. It's still the exact same thing. We do have a picture of it, it's just a different one. This is a sem um, seminiferous tubule. So inside the testes, right? This is just a zoomed up picture of the testes. So what can I see when I have that tubule? We know that we have all of our developing cells, right? And then our rule of thumb, so you guys don't have to be able to ID them, but again, that rule of thumb, the more closer we are to the lumen, the more mature they're getting, right? So spermatids usually gonna be in this area. Our stem cells gonna be on the outside. Now, other things that are very important about this cut of the testes, right? Is it just germ cells in here? No, we have two other really important cells that help regulate the entire process of spermatogenesis. So we have cells that are within our seminiferous tubules, right? That are helping out to nourish our sperm. Do we remember the names of those? It starts with an S. Sertoli cells, right? Their other name, their, their nickname is a nurse cell because they nourish the developing sperm. So our Sertoli cells are inside these uh, tubules, right? So inside with the sperm. Now we also have cells on the outside, right, on the interstitium. So all those little guys you can see, right, the nuclei, they're interspersed everywhere. So what do we call those cells? Lydig, 
lighting cells. Now they are very important because um, are they technically nourishing the sperm? Is that their job? Not really. What is it that they're doing? They're producing what? Testosterone, right. So they are really important for testosterone production. And then our cells in here are sensitive to that testosterone. So lighting cells in the interstitium, so they're outside of the tubule, they're gonna be making testosterone. Sertoli cells inside with the developing sperm to nourish that sperm. Okay, so speaking of Sertoli cells, Sertoli cells can release the hormone inhibit, right? Inhibit means to inhibit. So they, uh, in what regards would we release this? Why would our Sertoli cells release inhibit? Right, when we have excessively high sperm counts, right? So we saw that we have millions and billions of cells uh, produced um, in a very quick period of time. So we wanna make sure that we have some feedback mechanisms to lower that sperm count. Now, can we remember where inhibit targets? So it's gonna target one of those endocrine tissues, right? That's, regard, that's regulating <coughs> hormonal um, input. But do we think that it targets the hypothalamus or does it target the pituitary? So this guy is gonna target the pituitary. So specifically, inhibit is gonna uh, downregulate FSH. So follicle stimulant hormone, right? So if I downregulate FSH, I'm gonna lower the amount of sperm that's gonna be developing. Likewise, testosterone can also provide negative feedback. So if I have very high levels of testosterone, it can also target the endocrine system. It's just a different location. So high levels of testosterone will target the hypothalamus. Now that should make sense. If I target the hypothalamus to downregulate GnRH, that means that I'm downregulating the entire process, right? Because if I lower my amounts of gonadotropin releasing hormone, I'm going to likewise lower my amounts of FSH and LH. Okay, generally, what is our pH of semen? So I'm not looking for a number. Is it acidic or alkaline? Alkaline, right. Why is it alkaline? Because the vagina is acidic, right? So we have to make sure we can neutralize that. Uh, we saw different glands, right, that are going to be providing fluid for the production of semen. So specifically those seminal vesicles, so the ones that are behind the bladder, right, that are going to be right behind kind of leading into that ejaculatory duct. So those seminal vesicles will provide fluid. Inside that fluid, there's two really important things that are really good for the, for, or the maintenance of semen. So do we remember what two things that they provide? Fructose, right, so we have to have sugar because the sperm need to be able to go through a, a metabolism, right? They gotta be able to survive for at least, you know, two, three days. So we also are making prostaglandins, right? Now it's a small amount, but it's to facilitate that opening of the cervix a little bit, right? So having a little bit easier time for the sperm to go through the cervix. Okay, and then one of our glands is gonna be making pre-ejaculate. That little one, right? The vulval urethral gland, right? So the one that's usually the first, uh, the first one up. Okay, so different regions. So if we look for urethra first, right? <coughs> What is our very first region of the urethra up there? It's going through what structure? The prostate, so what do we call it? Prostatic, right? So our prostatic urethra. Then we have a very tiny region that's on top of those vulval urethral glands. We call that what? Starts with an M. Membranous, right? So membranous urethra, and then the bulk of the urethra, do we remember what that's called? So all of this. Uh, so spongy, spongy urethra. Now it will make sense that it's called spongy urethra because what is the tissue that it cuts through? <coughs> Corpus spongiosum, right? So it's named after the tissue, the erectile tissue that it goes through. So speaking of those erectile tissues, right? We just mentioned the urethra goes through corpus spongiosum. So I see that right <coughs> over here. These guys, do we remember what they're called? 
corpus cavernosa, right? So out of these tissues, these are the major erectile bodies, right? So they are the ones that will really go through a lot of vasodilation to engorge. This one still can, it just again has that kind of differing function. So it presses against the other two to make sure that the urethra remains open. So we have those different tissues, right? Different regions. Do we remember the different regions of the penis? What's the very first? I don't know if the mouse will show up here, but what's the very, yeah, very first area? Do you remember this? It's internal, so it's inside the body. It's called the root, right? And then you just have shaft or body, and then over here, what is this? Glands, right? Okay, so moving on to female repro, right? When we're looking at general anatomy, so let's do more external and work our way inside. So external, very first outer flap, what do we have? Labia majora, right? Majora for bigger, right? So major. So labia majora, and then what is this one? Labia what? Minora. So labia majora, labia minora. Together, what are they called? Vulva, right? So we have those external structures. Semi-external, what is this? It's gonna be the clitoris. So, right, we have those three that are considered a little bit more external. If we follow through, we're gonna go, of course, this is gonna be the bladder and the urethra. If we go behind it, right, vaginal canal. What is this area? Cervix, right, and then we go into the uterus. That uterus has three different layers. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, on top, we see the fallopian tubes, right? So fallopian tubes that are then contacting those ovaries. Okay, so for chest area anatomy. So mammary glands, correct? I have my mammary glands. Now, first we can ask, do we remember how the mammary glands and the fat is gonna be anchored into the pectoralis? Suspensory ligaments, right? It's all of the, the white, right? So all of these guys are suspensory ligaments that are going to be attaching. So for our mammary lobules, so all through here, do we remember our cells that actually make the milk? So think of the respiratory system, right? Alveolar cells, right? So alveolar cells are responsible for making the milk. We see that that will drain to our lactiferous duct, so lactiferous for lactation. That goes into our lactiferous sinus, which will exit via the nipple. What is the, the pigmented area around the nipple? We have the areola, right? So areola, and then we can be even more specific, these little lumps, right? They're going to be glands of Montgomery, so they're the oil production center of lubrication in the area. Now, um, do we also remember, so let's say, right, we're, we're on the theme of lactation. Our alveolar cells make the milk under what hormone? So milk production is prolactin, right? Prolactin influences the alveolar cells to produce that milk. What influences the contraction of the lobules? Oxytocin, right? So oxytocin is for milk ejection, right? Prolactin is for the production of milk. Okay, we've already answered that. So our vulva, we know that that is the labia majora and the minora. Now, working our way to the ovaries, right? We know that there's gonna be different cells other than just an egg. We have our follicular cells that are inside of there. Why are fecal cells so important? Fecal cells are the outside ring, right, of the follicle. So the outer follicle, they're very important because they make something. What are they making? Are they making estrogen? No, they're not making estrogen. What are they making? Testosterone, right? So they're making testosterone. Do we use that or do we keep the testosterone as is? Most of it, no. So of course there will be some that will be residual, but most of that gets converted to estrogen via our granulosa cells, right? So all the cells that are inside the follicle um, are going to be taking that testosterone and converting it to estrogen, which will directly impact the development of the follicle in the egg. Okay, so our folliculogenesis, right? So looking at the development of the follicles as well as the egg maturation. So when we start out, right, before birth, so in the fetal stage, 
over here, what do we call those follicles? The earliest follicles are primordial, right? Primordial <coughs> follicles. What type of egg is inside of there? Primary or secondary? Primary, right? Those are going to be your options like for all of these, right? You're either going to say primary or secondary. So primordial follicle, primary egg. After puberty or during, right, on the onset of puberty, when we get signals to start maturing, what are we going to progress to? What follicle? Primary, right? Primary follicle, what is the egg inside? Still primary, right? So primary follicle, primary egg. I start to see my grain or my um, cuboidal epithelium, right? So we go now to what follicle? Secondary, what type of egg? Don't get tripped up. It's still primary. So even though it's a secondary follicle, it is still a primary egg. Because we mentioned, right, we are only going to have the maturation of a full uh, secondary oocyte once we're ready to ovulate. So we got to get here until before we get to being secondary. So we have secondary follicle, primary oocyte. What about here? What is that follicle? So I start to see a fluid-filled space, right? So we call that an antrum space. So it is considered an antral follicle. So we also will again have that primary oocyte. Technically, at the very smack end of this stage is when it will mature into secondary. But we lump it into this because once we see a mature follicle, we know that that is a mature egg. So that is a secondary oocyte. So this follicle, what's another name for our mature follicle? What do we call that? Starts with a G. Graphian, right? Graphian follicles are our mature follicles. So we have our graphian follicle, right? We build up that antral fluid. We build it and build it. Our, our, our uh, uh, tissue is going to thin out, and eventually we will burst. So what is this? What is this process? What is what we're going through, right? Ovulation, right? So we're rupturing from that follicle. Now, technically, we don't have it pictured here, but we know that there is a small middle step. So before I go into my corpus structure, so before I go into that degradation, do we remember the kind of transient state that we take on when we uh, directly after ovulation? So that rupturing, right, will sometimes break capillary beds. So what's going to happen if I start bursting capillary beds? I'm going to start bleeding, correct? Right, if I'm bursting capillary beds. So blood will come inside of your clot. So we make that temporary structure, right, corpus hemorrhagicum, so hemorrhage, right, to bleed. So after we have corpus hemorrhagicum, we can now progress to the degradation of the follicles. This guy, named after Latin for yellow, do we remember it? Corpus what? Luteum, luteum, or luteal. So corpus luteum, right, big one involved in pregnancy, which we'll talk about. And then our final degradation, which basically results in scar tissue, is corpus what? White for albicans, right? So our stages of follicular development, right? Again, it's very, very important. Now, before we actually so let's talk a little bit more about the egg. So egg itself, right? We know that, of course, in a graphia follicle, this is secondary oocyte. What do we call that protein layer outside of the egg? The coating of proteins, zona pellucida, right? Zona pellucida is there to protect the egg. Um, and we already mentioned, right, all of the cells inside are our granulosa cells. Specifically, once we get these cells that make kind of a radiating crown, right, around the egg, those are called And then we can even, I don't think I uh, mentioned it, but we can even do um, regions. So where I see all of that vasculature, what region of the ovary is this? <coughs> medulla, right, so just like a kidney, we have medulla, and then our follicles are in the cortex. Okay, so we mentioned this, but corpus hemorrhagicum, right? So the timing directly after ovulation, right? If I physically burst open a it stands to reason that some blood vessels and tiny capillaries are probably going to rupture. What structure provides progesterone and estrogen for the uterus? So in the ovary, right, what is giving us progesterone? What's telling us to not shed our uterine lining? Corpus luteum, right? We mentioned that that is the big uh, follicle or the degradation follicle that tells us do not 
not shed your uterine lining, right, your functional layer, because you are preparing for implantation. What hormone will directly cause ovulation? <coughs> what do we think? Is it estrogen? Is it testosterone? Is it FSH? What do we think? It's going to be luteinizing hormone. Okay, so we have technically it's a whole bunch of estrogen tells the uh, <coughs> tells the pituitary to make a surge of luteinizing hormone. The luteinizing hormone will directly influence that ovulation event. So fertilization, where does fertilization occur? In where? Is it in the uterus? No, where is fertilization occur? Fallopian tubes, right? But if you answered that, you would get half credit. So let's be more specific. So where in the fallopian tubes? See that? Do we remember? So there is a widening in the fallopian tubes, which is the site of fertilization. Do we remember what we call the widening? Starts with an A. Ampulla, right? So in the fallopian tubes, we've got those different regions, right? Infundibulum is the one that has all the fimbriae. We go into, we get the ampulla, which is the widening. So that's where we're going to have that fertilization. Okay, our uterine layers, right? So layer closest to the lumen. What is that one? Closest to the inside. The one that's going to be shed, right? Endometrium, right? So we have endometrium. What is our muscle layer? Myo for muscle, right? Myometrium. And then connective tissue, anchoring, peri, right? Perimetrium. So, uh, before we answer that one, when we're talking about the endometrium, is the entire endometrium shed every month? <coughs> no, right? We have to have a basal layer to regenerate it, so we only shed the functional layer. Our uterine cycle will have three different phases. Do we remember them? So starting off, we'll go easy. We're starting off with menses, right? Starting off with menstruation. What is the next phase when I have to regrow that functional layer? What do we call that? Proliferative, right? So to proliferate means to divide and to grow, right? So we go from menses to proliferative. And then our last phase, which is preparing for implantation, is when we have a lot of vasculature growing, a lot of uterine glands growing. What do we call that? Secretory, right? So to secrete means, right, we're secreting a lot of uh, hormones in this area. Okay, so going a little bit more general, pre right or monosomy of what chromosome it is going to be chromosome 5 right so we remember chromosome 5 why is that such a big deal what is there in chromosome 5 a very special protein right catenin delta 2 so that protein extensively used in the nervous system so maintaining neuronal health so we saw that that's linked to those severe intellectual now, just for fun, do we remember the second, the, the other name for pre -tachot? What it used to be called? What syndrome it was called? Cat's cry, right? Why was it called cat's cry? Because they present with deformities right in their nasal bridge. So their nasal bridge is too short, it's too deep. So when they vocalize, it apparently sounds like a lot like a cat. All right, so pre -tachot, we understand that. Endometriosis. So growth of endometrial tissue where? Outside the uterus, right? So it's endometrial tissue that is anywhere where it should not be. So common location, right? Fallopian tubes are very common. On the outside of the uterus is also common. So that um, uh, the parametrium, right? You have uh, endometriosis. You can have it uh, just inside the abdominal cavity. So why is that such an issue? Why does that present with Scar tissue, right, so if I'm bleeding out into my own abdominal cavity, that will irritate the tissue, causes inflammation, which damages cells, right? Specifically, if you have endometriosis on your fallopian tubes, right, they will get inflamed, they will scar over, and then you're not going to have proper space, proper traveling for the egg uh, to be released or the sperm to find the egg. Okay, so going into our selections for pregnancy. So really good cycle.
cycle, right? Showing us our different stages. So very first stage of development, fetal development, of course we understand now, right, how we get fertilized, but first stage that lasts about two weeks, what do we call that? Are we an embryo yet? No, so we call this the pre-embryonic stage, right? So before we're an embryo. So we start off as that zygote, right? We start to divide. Do we remember the process of just dividing cells? We're not necessarily getting bigger, but we are dividing and we're getting more cells. So that process is called cleavage, right? So cleavage means, right, to cleave, to divide the cells. So once we get to our 16 cell stage, we now get a name. Our name is that morula, right? So morula will directly lead into the development of our blastocyst. So blastocyst, really good because this is the very first stage I start to see specialized cells, correct? It's no longer just random stem cells. So here I have cells that will serve a purpose. They will eventually go into making something. Do we remember the blue clump? What do we call those cells? If we don't remember what they're called, do we remember what they will form? Is that what's gonna be forming the baby? Yes. So the blue cells are called embryoblast, meaning that they will form the embryo. So embryoblast, all of these red cells. Now, if I'm not making the embryo, if I'm not making the baby, what could I be making? the vasculature, right? That external vasculature, which we call the chorion, right? So we have the chorion, which is, the cells are called trophoblasts. So trophoblast cells will make our chorion, the vasculature, and the embryoblast will be making the embryo. So after we progress, do we remember the event that ends this pre-embryonic period? So I'm traveling through the fallopian tubes, right? So where do, what's my next destination? I go into the lumen of the uterus, right? And then what happens? I will attach to the functional layer. So implantation. Once we have implantation, that usually cuts off this period. So our pre-embryonic period will end with that implantation of the blastocyst. Then we go through gastrulation. So gastrulation, we're acquiring special tissue. So those special stem cells that we'll talk about in a bit. Our cells will start folding over. We start get, uh, we start to see a lot of right development of appearance, and then we go into that again embryonic period, and then our fetal period. So of course here we're going to have organogenesis, right? So here we're very susceptible to teratogens, to carcinogens that could uh, inhibit organ development. Um, uh, and then out of all of these stages, right, which is the longest, pre-embryonic, embryonic, or fetal. So the vast majority of pregnancy, right, 30 weeks is gonna be fetal, right? Just time for the baby to grow and to further mature its tissue. Of HCG. It tells the 
the ovaries, right? Specifically, it tells the ovaries to keep corpus luteum. Because if I keep corpus luteum, we already talked about how corpus luteum acts as a placenta before we develop the placenta, right? So we keep it around, right? About 12 weeks, and then we can degrade it once we have that placenta. Okay, so we already kind of mentioned with the chorion, right? Vasculature for the baby, but it is not the internal vasculature, it is outside. So it contacts the maternal vasculature in the placenta. So allowing us to have proper gas exchange. Now our three germ layers. So also important during gastrulation. So our germ layers that give rise to all of our organs, all the tissue. If I am making skin, where is my uh, lineage from? Skin would be what? Your nervous system, right? All of that is ectoderm. So it's easy to remember skin, but you also have to remember all the nerves in the brain and all that good stuff. So skin and nervous system, ectoderm tissue, right? What about all of our muscle? Smooth muscle, cardiac muscle is mesoderm, meso for muscle, right? And then what about all of our, most of our internal organs? Endo, right, for within, so endoderm. So all of those germ cells, right, are during that gastrulation phase. And then we have our differences of labor. So how would we describe the difference between true and false labor? Uh, obviously, other than true labor leads to childbirth. So what is the difference? Both of them are contractions. So how do they differ? Cervical, yeah, cervical morphology, right? So in uh, false labor, right, with Braxton Hicks contractions, you do not have changes in the cervix, right? True labor, you will. So that's going to be our big one. Of course, you're going to have minor differences like the intensity and the frequency and all that kind of stuff. Now, our hormones that facilitate true labor. So we've got two really big ones that are very important. What we got? Stimulates contractions are going to be what? Just like in the breast. Oxytocin, right? It's a contraction hormone. So oxytocin will stimulate uterine contractions. But what else do I have to have? That cervix has to dilate, and it doesn't do it on its own. So how does the cervix dilate? Major amount of prostaglandins, right? We already saw prostaglandins will dilate the cervix from male repro, but this is just on a higher level. So prostaglandins have to be in the picture. Oxytocin has to be in the picture. Our stages of true labor is so really easy, right? So we just mentioned that it has to start with dilation, right? So dilation, and then what comes after that? Expulsion, right? And then after that, once the baby is out, our last stage, the afterbirth, right? So getting rid of the placenta. Which of those stages is the longest? Typically dilation, right? So that first stage is usually the longest. If I have never been pregnant before, what would you call me? Nully Taurus, right? Now, does that mean I'll have an easier or harder time? Typically harder time, right? Usually you don't have the working memory for the uterine contractions just yet. Okay, and then lactation, we already mentioned with our alveolar cells, but we also have to uh, understand, right, the whole process. So we mentioned oxytocin is for the ejection, right? Prolactin is for making them. And then what also, so if this was an essay question, you would also have to talk about a third hormone. Can we guess what third hormone that is? Absolutely, right. If you still have dopamine, you can't make milk. So we have to decrease our levels of dopamine because dopamine is considered a prolactin inhibiting hormone. So we have to downregulate dopamine so that we can make prolactin and then we'll have that lovely positive feedback loop, right? Baby sucking at the nipple, those mechanosensors tell the hypothalamus to go secrete those uh, hormones. 